Anzac. Anzac begins the game at war with Germany and Italy, both of which are on the other side of the world. Anzac may declare war on Japan at the beginning of the combat move phase of any of its turns, resulting in a state of war between Japan and both Anzac and the United Kingdom. When not yet at war with Japan, in addition to the normal restrictions, Anzac may not move units into China. It may, however, move units into Dutch territories as a non-combat movement at any time, as long as those territories have not been captured by an Axis power. It may actually take control of the Dutch territories, gaining their IPC income by moving land units into them. Additionally, the ANZAC considers attacks back against any Dutch territories to be acts of war against it directly. Italy At the beginning of the game, Italy is at war with France, the United Kingdom, and ANZAC. Italy may declare war on the United States, the Soviet Union, or China at the beginning of the combat move phase of any of its turns. A state of war between Italy and one of these three powers will not affect its relations with the other two. The United States The United States begins the game at war with no one. In addition to the normal restrictions, while it's not at war with Japan, the United States may not move any units into China. While not at war with Germany or Italy, the United States may not move sea units into sea zones that are adjacent to territories in either Africa or Europe including the United Kingdom and Scotland. If the United States has war declared on it by an Axis power, or Japan makes an unprovoked declaration of war on the UK or ANZAC, the United States may declare war on any or all Axis powers. On turn 3, if it's not yet at war, the United States may declare war on any or all Axis powers at the beginning of the collect income phase of that turn. The bonus income for the United States in the global game is if it's at war and controls the eastern, central, and western United States. If it does, then it collects a bonus of 30 IPCs each turn. China China begins the game at war with Japan. China can't declare war on a European Axis power unless one of those powers first declares war on it. A state of war between China and one Axis power won't affect its relations with the other Axis power. France France is at war with Germany and Italy. France may declare war on Japan at the beginning of the combat move phase of any of its turn. Remember that when the territory of France is liberated, the player controlling France places four French infantry units on France. This will only happen once per game. A few additional rules. When major industrial complexes are captured, you convert them to minor industrial complexes and remove any damage markers in excess of six that are on them. They remain as minor industrial complexes until upgraded. So in our German flow of play example, when the Germans captured France, this major industrial complex here would be replaced with a minor one. Also, San Francisco is not considered to be a capital, so the, the United States doesn't lose its unspent IPCs if the Western United States is captured by an enemy power. Well, that's quite a game, huh? Well, what do I th so what do I think of uh, Axis and Allies Europe, Pacific, and Global 1940? Well, as far as pricing and availability, uh, each theater game is going to cost you about $80 a piece. Uh, so if you want to play the global game, you're looking at about $160 bucks investment. Uh, it is currently still available. Uh, you can find it on many online stores or your friendly local game store. As far as the components go, uh, Europe 1940 is much better than Pacific 1940. Uh, for me, Pacific 1940 felt very rushed outdoor. Uh, the rules are, uh, to be blunt, quite terrible. Uh, there are a lot of ambiguities and it's very confusing. Uh, so make sure you uh, go on the internet and download the fact. It will make, thing, make things much clearer. I just wish there was a way to get a hands on a much corrected uh, Pacific 1940 rule book. It's that bad. Um, add to that the component faux pas uh, shipping the wrong battle strip, uh, the one from the 1942 version. Um, so you have to, if you buy it and you get the wrong combat strip, you have to, you know, write or call Wizards of the Coast customer, customer support and get the right one. Also, with Pacific, uh, the cardstock is very thin and flimsy. Um, the other issue I have with the components are uh, the miniatures are really nice, but it's very hard sometimes to distinguish between the cruisers and the destroyers. Um, again, each of the unit types 
uh, each of the units for the different countries are going to be individualized. Um, so you have to use that reference chart in the Europe rule book to constantly look up, uh, especially with the destroyers and the cruisers, which is which. Um, but as far as the pros, the map is really great. Uh, the colors are nice. Um, you know, when you, if you buy both Europe and Pacific and put them together, uh, the size of the map and the quality of the map is just jaw-dropping. You just have to see it. On the Europe side of things, the rule book is very well done. Uh, the core mechanics is very well explained. Uh, the appendix for the global rules is very clear. Uh, and the reference chart for the unit types is at the back is, is very handy. Uh, so big thumbs up on the Europe rule book. And again, the miniatures are excellent overall. They look very nice. They're very detailed. Some players will even go so far as to custom paint the miniatures. Also, the battle strip and other cart and the facilities are on thicker card stock, so overall Europe is much better. But even still, I would recommend you going on BoardGameGeek.com and looking at some of the uh, user-contributed player aids for this game. They're done quite well. Uh, you'll find, for example, some of these uh, player-specific reference cards for each of the countries with the national objectives printed on them, you know, the uh, turn order, uh, the phases that we went over, uh, the initial setup, and then a reference chart for each of the unit types, including their movement, their cost, their attack, and defensive values. Basically what's printed on the board, but rather than walking around the board having to constantly look at that chart, you can just look at, look at your uh, player reference sheet. Uh, there are also some player aids for better combat board or strip, uh, where it has the silhouettes, but also the notes about uh, when you're doing combined arms about, you know, like artillery supporting infantry and mechanized infantry, etc. There are also improved player aids for the national production chart. It shows a little icon of the country for the, for the starting IPCs and also the uh, national objectives and bonus income. So you can just put a little marker on there when you achieve that uh, national objective and keep track of your bonus income. Uh, so what you can do is just print this out on uh, in color on regular paper and then go out to um, an office supply store or something and get some uh, self-adhesive foam core and just put it on there and it looks like a component that comes with the game and these are very nice so I highly recommend you going out to Board Game Geek downloading these and printing them, printing them out and mounting them uh, that is very cheap to do but very worthwhile in my opinion as far as the setup time it's going to be a long setup time you know you're looking at uh, 30 minutes to an hour for each theater to level game, uh, at least probably an hour for the global game, but it really depends on the number of players you have and how many can help setting up their own country. But if you're just doing it by yourself, uh, you know, to set up for your friends to come over and play with you, you're looking at at least an hour, I would say. As far as the flow of play goes, um, it, it does contain the core mechanics of the Axis and Allies series that we went over earlier. Uh, these are tried and true mechanics. I think they work very well. Um, but it does lead for some long turns, at least, at least for the first uh, couple of rounds of the game, and particularly for the larger major powers such, such as uh, Germany and Japan. And there's quite a bit of downtime when it's not your turn. So my recommendation is that when it's not your turn, use that time to strategize on what you're going to do for your next turn. Um, when you're playing the global game, um, you're looking at at least a weekend to play it. And even then, you know, I've seen session reports and in my games, uh, you may not finish it in that weekend. Uh, you just get to a point where you just have to call the game. Uh, so it can take a very long time to actually achieve the victory conditions to say you really won the game. As far as player scalability, it scales very well, particularly with the global game. Um, you know, you can have as few as two players. Uh, that will definitely make for a very long game. But it can scale all the way up to nine players, with each player having one country they're in control of. Uh, cleanup time, just like setup time, it's going to take a while to put all these units back in the boxes. You know, get everything um, put up in the boxes. Uh, the replay value, I think, is pretty low, unless you're really into these war games and you're just and you have the time uh, to play this 
to play this this kind of game. Um, but it's it's one of those things you may play you know once, twice, or maybe three times a year. And but it's a really enjoyable experience I think when you do play. So what I recommend this. Uh, I would definitely recommend the Axis and Allies series if you're at all interested in wargaming. Uh, if this is something new to you, or if you don't have that much time, you know, a weekend or so to commit to a global game, or you know, a day or two to commit to one of these theater level games, I would uh, highly recommend the 1942 version of, of the Axis and Allies game. Uh, it's relatively cheap; you can probably get it for around 30 bucks. Uh, it'll still take you around four or five hours to play, uh, but that that's pretty manageable for a war game like this. Uh, but if you're really into war games and you have the time, I do highly recommend taking a look at this game, the Europe and Pacific 1940 versions. And if you have the time, get both of them and put them together and have a, a great big global scale war game. So that does it for this episode of Board Game Review with Jason. Uh, if you stuck around for the whole episode, I really appreciate your time and I hope it was of value to you. Um, this was a lot longer than the first one. And, but it's my uh, intention to do episodes of different links concentrating on games of different complexity. Uh, so every now and then you may see one like this that you know is, is an hour or so long. <clears throat> uh, other times you may see lighter party games that are maybe only 10 minutes in length. But if you do enjoy a board game review with Jason, uh, tell your friends who may be interested in board games and want to try something new. Tell them about this podcast. Uh, you can go on YouTube under board game review WJ and see all the videos. Uh, you can find the uh, a Facebook page uh, board game review with Jason. Go on there and like that. You'll find some links and posts there. Uh, you can also subscribe to this podcast in iTunes. So just go into iTunes and subscribe to the podcast and, and you'll get the latest episode. And if you find these reviews are valuable to you and you buy one of these games as a result of this podcast, Please contact the publisher and let them know. This helps them to understand the value of these podcasts. And also let me know what you think of these podcasts. Uh, I'm looking to improve and keep doing things better. So drop me an email at boardgamereviewwithjason at gmail.com. So until next time, see ya.